Okay, everybody, we figured it out. Jack Newton's live with us here at, uh, uh, he's from Portal, Arizona right now, um, uh, and I'm in Arkansas. And uh, anyhow, I, uh, I want to apologize for, you know, the, uh, the glitch here, but uh, uh, Jack, uh, you were talking about how you got started in amateur astronomy uh, and uh, we, you were talking about the first time you looked at Saturn, right? That's right. I independently discovered it when I was about eight or nine years old with my uh, home, or at least home, uh, with my telescope that I got for Christmas. What kind and, of a telescope uh, was this? This was called a Jupiter telescope. And uh, I imagine it was a, a Japanese uh, made instrument. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it had, uh, it was a 50 millimeter, three eyepieces, a, a sun filter and a moon filter. And, uh, it was a very stable little, uh, one because it had just three prongs uh, of steel as a tripod. Mm -hmm. So it was very good. And, uh, at, uh, uh, took it out to schoolyard three doors down and, uh, was able to, um, uh, set it up. And, uh, lo and behold, while well, I was, looking at these new objects that uh, every 14 days the chain, the sky rises uh, another hour higher mm -hmm. and things that weren't visible uh, became visible and uh, I made the independent discovery and was so thrilled and after going to school and trying to convince anybody that I was actually seeing the ring around Saturn, right. they didn't believe me. Right. <laughs> and so uh, at that point I said, man, I've got to get a camera. Yeah. And start doing astrophotography, and it was several years till I got a paper route and uh, raised enough money to get a single lens reflex camera, and uh, didn't even buy the the lens because it was twenty bucks more and it was a hundred dollars for the camera. <laughs> you just and, needed the uh, body anyways, right? So yeah, and so I yeah uh, I attached the uh, the microscope adapter to it and uh, made it fit the telescope and uh, started my first attempt at astrophotography. Oh, and, uh, from there, uh, anything that you needed in astronomy, it wasn't available. You uh, you had a, a few uh, um, telescopes, big Tasco telescopes, which are three or four thousand dollars to buy a, a three inch telescope, and uh, it was uh, staggering for somebody young. Really, yeah. And, uh, to get into it at that time. Oh, so you had to make your own telescopes, and right. so I was. Uh, I talked to the, the head of the planetarium in, in Winnipeg, uh, Frank Shin, and uh, he had made a 12-inch telescope, which was the biggest telescope in Winnipeg. And I said, I want a 12-inch telescope. And it was the biggest blank you could get from Edmund Scientific. Right. And so he showed me how to to do a uh, grind and polish uh, a 12-inch. And uh, that was my first telescope. And... Uh, <laughs> And immediately thereafter, of course, I was doing astrophotography, and uh, and the, the rest is history, of course. But uh, that was the start. Sure. Well, good. And, uh, <clears throat> so from from there, I mean, I, I know that you had built like a twenty-five inch Newtonian. Uh, uh, we just kept building bigger and bigger. bigger you, you had a twenty-five inch telescope uh, that you were climbing a ladder to. Uh, uh, you know, attach your cameras and look through and all the rest of it. And you built your own observatory dome and you built many domes uh, over the years. But uh, what was that? What was that gap like? You're you're working in maybe in a department store or something. You're a department store That's manager. That's right. I was managing a Marks and Spencer okay. store. OK. Uh, you could relate to Brooks Brothers in the U.S. Um, Marks and Spencer's own Brooks Brothers. Mm -hmm. And so it was a store like that, except we had a food division as well. And uh, at night, of course, I would uh, um, sneak off and, and, uh, and tow a telescope behind the car, 25 inch that we'd built, and uh, go out to Nisuk Park on Vancouver Island, a dark site, and set it up. And I had to polar align the whole, the whole trailer that uh, the telescope was built into. Ah, okay. And uh, would do that and then get up on a 10 foot stepladder and uh, an image. And of course, uh, sometimes when you're late at night in a provincial park, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that uh, the police will be notified. And 
quite often I'll be in the middle of a photograph and uh, lights will appear and uh, of course I don't know who they are and uh, I yell out a few expletives uh, of my disapproval of those lights and uh, only to find it was the Royal Canadian Mounted Police <laughs> and uh, they uh, they apologized for disturbing me and and uh, would uh, would head out and turn their lights off and uh, drive off the road <laughs> into the trees and uh, so it was a pretty ugly situation sometimes. But yeah, uh, back in those people, days, you're shooting for what thirty minutes, an hour? I don't know. Oh yeah, and we were. Uh, I designed uh, cold cameras where we would chill the film down to 109 below zero with dry ice to. Uh, to cure the reciprocity failure of film, the ability of it to keep on chugging. And uh, mm -hmm. we used to uh, um, do hypersensitizing of film and, and taking rolls of film and putting it in pure hydrogen and then throwing it in the oven and bake it for four hours. Yeah. And uh, we did all kinds of crazy things to try and improve it. Sure. And then, of course, uh, I was very fortunate because most of, uh, or a lot of the, the software development people, uh, Software BISC and uh, Santa Barbara Instrument Group uh, would send me uh, equipment. Mead, of course, uh, sure. uh, I was testing equipment for them for many years, as you know. Sure, yeah, I was very and, uh, involved in You're that. my inside source of, uh, yeah. of, of equipment, and uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was fantastic, the, 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 the development that we were able to do. The uh, I was able to take the first uh, CCD image ever taken with a uh, uh, with a digital camera that had just been invented, and uh, most of them had to be handmade. And I got one uh, actually from Santa Barbara that they were they had put together, and they sent me the uh, in fact the uh, I, I got the number three I think was on the prototype, and uh, I. Uh, I had to get up on top of my, my 25 inch telescope with only a three foot cord going to the computer from the camera. And so I've got three step ladders at 10 feet oh, tall with all the equipment. Up. And, and, and when, I, when I was de dealing with the first prototype of the ST6 camera, they, uh, I had to put voltage onto a circuit board in three different voltages in three different spots on this alpha model to get it to work. And I was taking the first CCD images ever. Yeah, uh, on a Chrome camera, right? Real CCD. Yeah, and uh, mm -hmm. what uh, what I did was I took the, the Christmas uh, uh, cellulose off of uh, candy boxes and I was able to get a red, green, and a blue uh, one. And I mounted them in 35 millimeter slide, or at least slides. And then I built, a machined up a slide holder that would go in front of the camera. And I took the first color shot ever taken with a CCD camera. You made your own filter wheel. And, well, yeah, just I just know. individual red, green, and blue. Right. And I took a picture of the Dumbbell Nebula and, uh, and on, on floppies and sent it to Richard Berry, who was the editor of Astronomy Magazine. Yeah. There was not a program that he had that you could put a color picture on a screen. And so we had to write the program to get the RGB together so he got a color picture on the screen. Oh and then he just couldn't believe it. Uh, and he was jumping up and down. He phoned me and I said, well, thanks a lot. I can, I've got a black and white monitor. And uh, at any rate, it ended up on the front page of uh, Astronomy Magazine. Oh, yeah. uh, I think I remember that. That was uh, it said, amazing. It, it was said, startling how much detail there was. And, and, and it uh, said, uh, Astron or what did it say? Uh, um, astronomy goes electric. I think that was the, something like. I didn't even that. have the terminology out. That's and then, uh, and then, uh, Sky and Telescope brought out a sub magazine uh, called CCD uh, um, Imaging or something, and uh, I was on the cover of that with uh, using uh, a Santa Barbara uh, chip and uh, Maxim DL, which was. Uh, 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 Seagal um, had uh, come oh, up with a program. You and uh, yeah. Ajay Seagal had... Um, yeah, so Ajay had written a hidden image. And, uh, right. And so it was a deconvolution program. He did it. In fact, he got his master's degree. Uh, uh, and that was his thesis. And uh, the U.S. military was really excited with it because they could take uh, 
um, pictures that are taken from space and then deconvolute them and sharpen them. And, uh, and also, uh, um, you know, there'd be a drugstore robbery in a blurry picture and uh, he'd run it through and it becomes crystal clear and the guys would plead guilty right away when they saw their picture. Exactly. It's yeah. an answer, yeah. license yeah. plates on the Ever, right? It's great for astrophotography, and so I took m many years of shooting uh, and enhancing pictures that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was kind of nice to be right back at the beginning and, and the forefront. I got the the first uh, first can our first telescope ever um, to that was digitized, so that it could. Uh, they sent you what they called uh, I had the software Bisk Brothers. Uh, send me a prototype with encoders that I had to machine up the parts to put it on the RN deck of the telescope. And it would, uh, through a, a, what they called a B-box, would uh, RS-232 plug into the computer, and you could actually see crosshairs as you drag the telescope. And you could drag it up um, and uh, put it on, say, M13, globular cluster, and then uh, go over to the computer and click on M13 on their sky program, and it would link. And so now the telescope is talking to the computer. And as I drag the telescope over, say, the ring nebula, then uh, and look through the eyepiece, there it is. And so I said, I wonder if I can see stars in the daytime, because you can never find them. And so I just left everything running all night, so I didn't want to break the connection. Yeah, picture. Let me see if I can bring this up here. And I got up. Uh, it right here. This is a picture that uh, that Jack. Go ahead and tell your story. Okay. The uh, so what I did was uh, I dragged the telescope over top of Vega, and of course this is December. Okay, and it's now in the winter sky near the sun. Right. And. Uh, and so I looked in the telescope, and holy cow, it was bright. I couldn't believe it. And, of course, Vega has a lot of stars nearby. And so I went fainter and fainter and fainter until finally I split Epsilon and Lyra, the double-double, fifth magnitude stars. I split both of them. And this is like 11 or 12 o'clock in the, in the day. And uh, this was a 25-inch telescope. And so uh, I phoned uh, um, uh, one of the editors, uh, David uh, or uh, Dennis DeChico, uh, to Sky and Telescope. He said, Dennis, you're not going to believe what I'm doing. And he says, what are you doing, Jack? <laughs> and I said, I'm splitting Epsilon and Lyra, the double-double, right now in my observatory. Um, and he said, well, where in the hell are you? And I said, I was uh, in, uh, in um, British Columbia in, in, in Victoria. And he said, well, what time is it there? And I said, 12 noon. And he said, this is where I hang up. <laughs> 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 and it wasn't until several years later that he finally got a, a Mead telescope that, could, uh, that was computer controlled. And he was able to actually uh, uh, duplicate what I had done. But I was the first person in the world to see stars in the daytime. Yeah, that's amazing. So this shot that you sent to me, uh, you just took with your iPhone, and uh, yeah, well, we're, that, uh, that mark off a star. That, which bright star do you have in the field of that shot? That's actually Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, okay. And what time of the day is this? Clock in the morning. And uh, so I'm running the, the bed and breakfast in Canada, and it's astronomy theme bed and breakfast. You've got a picture of the, the house there. Bring that up here for you. And, uh, if you pop it up, and because uh, Marks and Spencer decided to leave the country, and I was going to be out of work, and uh, and we had a, a house in, in East Souk and in on Vancouver Island with a big dome on the roof, and and we looked at our guest book, and we had three thousand signatures of people that had gone through the telescope in about four years, oh, wow. and so I thought, well, maybe we should try and build a, a bed and breakfast themed because uh, I was going to lose my job. And I was only 55. Uh -huh. And so we, we uh, I, I talked to Jim Hess, the director of the uh, Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, he gave me the site tests on Mount Kobo, which was in a Soyuz, and it was the best site in Canada to build a telescope. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. at any rate, we built one and, and opened it up as a B&B. So the, the guests, in fact, we've had our 20th anniversary yeah. now at the bed and breakfast. But I'm showing them right now, so it shows the observatory up on on top and the the yeah. balcony. So, 
third floor, and uh, we've put 16,000 people through the observatory in the last 20 years. Wow. And so every morning, uh, we do an evening session, of course, uh, with a half-meter telescope, the uh, the max, and uh, I was going to say the maximum, but it was the... Uh, the 20-inch RC, yeah. and uh, and or we uh, um, in the morning uh, after breakfast we take them up to show them the sun in H alpha, and I says, by the way, how would you like to see some stars in the daytime? And so I just punch it in, and uh, the uh, telescope heads for uh, well, I, I usually like to do uh, um, Betelgeuse, juice, and, and then I'll if. Uh, if Castor is up, I'll put it on Castor and the Gemini twins, and then those two stars are seeing in the blue sky. And uh, just to prove it, she can't use your camera to take a picture of your nighttime cameras because they get overwhelmed. Right. And you, you just grab the iPhone, hold it up over the eyepiece, and go click, and there's the star. And, there. and <laughs> you can see the little star in the, uh, in the eyepiece. And uh, as I say, you can see down to sixth magnitude. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of funny stuff. Before we get too too much uh, further ahead, uh, I was reading something I was always curious about. Um, you won uh, or was honored with the uh, the Queen Elizabeth II Silver Jubilee Medal in 1971. Is that right? That's right. The uh, what was all that about? I mean, well, it, the, uh, the Queen the Queen uh, uh, allocated medals to service organizations in Canada and, and uh, uh, amongst the Commonwealth. And uh, so there was a limited number of, of medals given to Canada. Hmm. And uh, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada were given, I think, two medals uh, or, or one that, uh, that they could give to somebody that they felt was deserving. And uh, I was fortunate enough to to have that presented by the uh, uh, Jules Leger, who is the, uh, the uh, I guess, uh, Julie Payette's that now, the uh, Governor General of Canada. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, that was kind of exciting. But uh, um, I've certainly had a long list of, uh, of, of awards. And, uh, oh, yeah. and I've been in your home and, and have seen all the things and the, the – uh, the front covers of uh, like uh, Time Magazine, I believe, or Life Magazine, perhaps, and uh, uh, National Geographic, and uh, lots of really cool stuff. So you've gone through these different phases. You know, you were uh, you were Mister Deep Sky for a long time, and then uh, and then you discovered uh, well, you didn't discover the sun. Some really amazing, mind blowing solar images and i remember having you were at riverside telescope makers conference with me one time and uh actually you were up there with me many times and um the guys from big bear solar observatory were there and you were showing them images that was blowing them away and uh so yeah, the start of uh, solar uh, imaging hi i was very very fortunate of course to be beta testing the ccd cameras and it was the same time that David Lunt had uh, uh, put out a, a commercial uh, uh, H-alpha filter for solar observing. And uh, he brought one out to, uh, to have me uh, look at. Right. So what was incredible was when you put the uh, um, CCD camera onto the uh, H-alpha, it was better than any film could ever possibly get. So I'm the only one in the world that has a CCD camera, and for this particular uh, uh, four-year period of Solar Max back then, and so I was blowing everybody in the world away, not because I was a good astrophotographer, but I had the equipment. Well, and, you uh, astrophotographers. It, was, <laughs> it was absolutely incredible, because the, the pictures are absolutely stunning what you could produce. Yeah. So that was, the image that's up right now is this, it's... Uh, life 70 years of uh, i guess 70 years so uh but just incredibly detailed uh image of the solar surface uh you know the details around the sunspots and this uh there's a coronal mass ejection coming off the sun and uh um, it was funny, I'd t taken guests upstairs at the B&B &B and said, uh, you know, there's some uh, really big sunspots uh, and uh, um, you, you, you've got to have a look at this. And so we looked and just at that moment, there was a huge coronal mass ejection coming off those sunspots. They're being ripped to pieces. 
And so I said, hang on, have a look. I got to photograph this. And so I photographed it. And uh, that ended up on the Coronado uh, website and then picked off by uh, Life magazine. And it ended up in the year end in pictures of life. And then four years later, when they did their 70th anniversary uh, of all the best shots in 70 years of life, that was the lead into the science section. Yeah. And uh, I'm in there with Ansel Adams. I'm in there with uh, uh, the guys walking on the moon and uh, all of the 9-11, everything. Uh, and uh, here's a, a Canadian uh, amateur with his uh, <laughs> shirt and a... Uh, lead into the science section. Right. Yeah, but you're down in the United States a lot. Cool. You're, you're in Arizona. So, and many things happen. If you do enough, are you breaking up? Are we all right? We're okay. We're okay. We just had a little, are you okay? a little, uh, you a little. Know, pickup, I guess. So, but, so uh, storm, no we're still, we're still up and still talking here. So, um, so you, uh, I know that you, Moved. You decided to make the move down to Florida with the uh, Chieflin Astronomy yeah. Village down there, yeah. right? That, yeah, we uh, we were fortunate enough to get a lot, um, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, there was about uh, oh fourteen lots or so, and uh, right. uh, we we uh, I'd lost my job, and uh, and so we built the. Uh, Florida Imaging Center, which was a B and B uh, for teaching astronomy, and uh, it was uh, very successful actually. And uh, we certainly broke even and made enough uh, money to uh, <clears throat> to help us in Canada. And uh, then we went back and built the uh, uh, the one in uh, in Canada. But uh, that was uh, that was great because I met so many wonderful people um, in the United States, and uh, and that gave me the impetus to uh, to do the Arizona Sky Village. And we were I took a light pollution map <clears throat> from space mm -hmm. and superimposed it on a road map in Photoshop so I could see where the darkest areas I could possibly find in southwestern United States. Right. And we ended up in Portal, Arizona, one of the darkest spots on earth practically and uh, That's true. managed to, to acquire a couple of hundred acres and uh, subdivide it and, and sell lots to astronomers and the rest is history we've got 32 homes in yeah. and uh, let, it, let me let me find this is a shot here of uh, of our complex yeah let me find it there it is there it is so you you it, this shows this shows your you know your hacienda out there. Um, the We've got, in the background are the Chiricahuas, is that right? That's correct. Chiricahua Mountains, and, uh, mm -hmm. and we're at uh, I guess uh, nearly uh, four thousand feet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, we get. Uh, Probably average about two arc seconds, but some nights you'll get one arc second, some nights three arc seconds, but yeah. two. And uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, able to do a lot of great supernova hunting. Um, there. I dedicated two telescopes to hunting for supernovas, and uh, over the lifespan of our our, our hunt, uh, I managed to, uh, I think I've got about 210 discoveries. Oh, my God. And, okay. That's all right. Puts me number two in the world, anyway. Number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As an amateur, Tim Puckett's number one, and he was uh, our principal, oh my principal investigator. Right. That's but. fantastic. So this is kind of a we're seeing a close up of the roll off roof observatory that you have here. It looks like the Mead sixteen inches inside of that. Um, yeah. Now, Mead 16. Did you build all these observatories yourself? Yeah, these are all I build everything by hand. All the domes I built. Uh, Mm -hmm. I guess eight domes now. The last um, four were 16 footers, and uh, <clears throat> you can see the there's two domes and the roll off on the property. Right. And uh, the max mount was on the one on top of the house, uh, and then the the big uh, I've got a big telescope. Uh, I think you've got a picture of it. Um, weighs a, a ton and a half. Yeah, 
look 3,000 pound. Yeah, look and these were dedicated to hunting for supernovas. And we would uh, shoot every night, all night. And uh, we had 14,000 images we could shoot in about 14 days. And, uh, and unfortunately, this month we shut her down. Um, the competition is just so great with Panstar and, uh, and uh, all the electronic ones that are automatically vacuuming up thousands of discoveries. Yeah. So we've, uh, we stopped at the 1st of November. You know, I, I, I think I'm going to take a little segue here. We, we were talking a little bit about the uh, Starlink satellites and... Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of challenges for amateur astronauts. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you've got, uh, you know, you, you've got uh, survey scopes going on. Okay, that 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 challenges astronomers for comet hunting and supernova work, and uh, um, you know, so it's things are narrowing more more. Uh, you know, well, the the space based ones are all right because they're above them. Um, so all of those um, telescopes that are uh, in orbit um, right. are, aren't affected by the, their, their low Earth orbits. But uh, if sunlight hits them, um, it's going to be devastating for, for amateurs, especially if they're going to 40,000. They're uh, talking about 40,000 in the constellation. Right. And, uh, but uh, if they're low enough and they don't get sunlight, then you won't see them. They'll just pass over uh, undetected, unless you're doing one of the surveys, uh, ground-based surveys, and infrared, they'll pick them up because they'll see the heat right? and, uh, and those frequencies. But uh, as far as amateurs go, you might get a bit of a reprieve as you uh, get into uh, winter where the, the, the sun is lower in the sky and... Uh, um, before I left uh, Canada in November, the space station was only visible for about three minutes, and then it disappeared into the Earth's shadow, sure. and it's gone. So any of those, you don't see satellites when uh, and when they're dark. Sure, right. Well, that's uh, it, it's I, I, it's getting a lot of uh, uh, concern by amateurs and professional astronomers. Uh, I think they're trying to do some of the modeling right now to see how is this going to affect some of those big uh, survey telescopes that's going up. So really terrible, absolutely terrible. That's all I can say because yeah. they're shooting frequencies that uh, that you can't block out, even if you paint them. Uh, infrared will penetrate that. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, uh, so it, Russia, it is. Uh, and others that are out there will think about uh, creating some sort of software that. Uh, um, that will help professional astronomers uh, overcome this problem. I don't see, I don't see anyone giving up, saying, "Hey, we're we're not going to have a global internet uh, connective system," you know. So, um, but um, well, time will tell. We'll see. Yeah, that's not the only constellation that's going up. There's uh, three or four others are also going up. They're just they don't have the. Uh, the rocket power that, uh, that SpaceX has to uh, to be able to deliver it at this point, right. but it is it is sad. It the is good sad. news is for me, I've got a plane wave now, and uh, the Explore Scientific, uh, the uh, 165 ED, and I'll tell you, I'm taking the best photographs of my whole life right now <laughs> with that combination. The uh, um, the uh, the plane wave. Uh, um, uh, what do they call it? Yeah, uh, that, uh, L3, 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 right? L350. Pay pardon? It's kind of like a single arm. Um, yeah, it's a single arm. I've got, uh, I've got your scope on one side of it, and I've got a, a Hyperstar F2 14 inch on the other side of it, and it's tracking at two tenths of an arc second. Ooh. <laughs> in both axes, two tenths of an arc second, and so I don't guide anymore. I just turn it on an object, take seven or eight minute shots, take three or four hours of them, and uh, process the data. And it has absolutely blows your mind. I think if you bring up an image I've taken of the uh, of uh, the, the Veil Nebula, have you got that shot there? Yeah, let me pull up the Veil for you. 
Now, there's two shots you sent me. I'll, I'll show this first one. Uh, yeah, there's. Uh, yeah, this I've taken four or five, uh, but the uh, star images are absolutely tiny with narrow band uh, filters, and uh, the. Uh, they're taken in H alpha and O3. And O3, most people may not realize, is actually uh, the true color is dead between uh, blue and green, and it's aquamarine. It's a beautiful color. And, and most people either make it a blue or they make it a green. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Both are wrong. It should be, you should use it for both colors. Mm -hmm. And so you only have to take two shots, one H alpha and the other, the uh, O3. And the O3 should be used for both blue and green, and you get aquamarine. And that's the true color of it. Right. But, um, let's, so you, let's look at the uh, other images here. We've got, um, well, this is a shot. This is a shot you did of the moon. Okay. Uh, we were talking. Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was the one. Uh, the high resolution one was it the yeah uh now there's there's an image of the apollo 15 landing that we can talk about but yeah that was the one on the left was yeah. taken from orbit of uh and that was uh, uh that was a a shot uh, from space above at the moon the one on the right is um taken from my observatory in uh, soyuz right. and it was uh, with the mead 16 with a three power barlow zoomed into that site and I took 1300 images and then uh, ran them through processing to get the high resolution and you can see where exactly where the landing site is you can see the two little craters on the on the left and right. uh, uh, and you see them on both my picture and uh, and the one taken by trace and uh, then uh, you can extrapolate uh, visually where the landing site is of course, it's not visible because I can't get down to, uh, you need about a, a 50th of an arc second to, uh, right. to, to resolve the, uh, but it's so, it shows you how close you can actually get as an amateur to, uh, to that. Right. Well, I've, had, I've done a lot of those. I did the, the deep sky field, you know, the blank piece of sky yeah. that Hubble did. Well, I took a shot of that same one for 40 minutes. Uh, with the Mead 16, and uh, the, I had the same chip that was in the Hubble Space Telescope in the camera that I was using, made by Tektronix. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got 55 galaxies in that blank field. And then there's another one I did, uh, one that showed lensing quasars. And uh, the, uh, the cluster of galaxies uh, was uh, 3 billion light years away. And the lensing marks were somewhere around 10 billion. And I can see the lensing marks uh, with the Mead 16 shot that I took of it. And so I can see objects that are 10 billion light years away. Amazing, amazing. Cool. Through, through. I'm going to show an image. Uh, this is IC2177. This is uh, an O3 shot that you have here. What, what can you tell us about this particular image? Well, again, it was, uh, it was taken with the uh, refractor. And what I do, I, I don't know whether um, your audience uses Wikisky. Uh, it's a great site, and you can go in and you can uh, um, zoom into objects um, and look at faint ones. They're all uh, photographic, so they're mm -hmm. um, ones that are done by the Palomar Sky Survey or, or, or um, Sloan and so on. And so you can look at all these faint H2 regions, and that was one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, although uh, um, I'm, I don't have that one on my screen right here. What was it, 2162, was it? Which one? 27. Uh, I don't have it here to have a look at it. 2177, did you say? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an uh, an IC uh, object. Nebula tra you know, trail going up. Uh, yeah, the uh, I, yeah, I can see it there. That um, is a uh, uh, a one hour uh, in uh, in H alpha and uh, one hour in O three, mm -hmm. and you'll see how small the star image is. And when you look at the uh, the ones on the internet, 
It's amazing what you can do with a refractor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you're certainly shooting uh, uh, better than the seeing. Um, the star images are absolutely outstanding and uh, unguided. Unguided. You just oh, yeah. Unguided. It's yeah. Tenths of an arc second with your. Yeah. Your it's. Wave. Uh, um, now, it's, let's show so up I, here. Let's, uh, I've got um, NGC 2174 uh, that you sent to me. Yeah, and uh, do I have that? 2174. I don't have it on my list right now, so I can't really tell because I can't see what it is that you've got. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. And the same thing. You're taking uh, several hours of uh, photography, and I can do these night after night, and I can also do them with a quarter moon in the sky. This doesn't, it's not affected by O3 or, or HL, but, and that means that you could be in New York, and if you had a clear sky and we're top top of a, a, a building, um, you could do the same thing because uh, uh, it just won't show up any of the pollution, or not the pollution, but the light pollution. The, uh, so it's um, people that want to shoot from their homes and cities uh, with uh, H, H Alpha and O3 can have a field day. There are a lot of people. I, I see a lot of images from people that live in suburbia and they roll out their telescopes out to the driveway and takes these incredible shots, you know? Yeah, that's uh, right. So the, the, the sky belongs to everybody and it's accessible now. That's right. So it's, it's really, really great. Right. And uh, certainly very exciting. And uh, certainly the, uh, um, I guess probably uh, you'll have the same problem with the uh, constellation of, uh, of, uh, of Elon Musk's uh, Elon. high school uh, will destroy maybe one or two of your images, but the uh, if you run a median filter, it'll erase them. Mm -hmm. Right. This is uh, the Christmas tree uh, nebula that you sent. Beautiful. Story. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, a, a big wide field and just tons of nebulosity everywhere, you know. Uh, the, yeah, and they again the shot with uh, with O3 and H alpha, right. and uh, you can also, uh, um, if you're doing something like the Orion Nebula, um, you can do uh, red, green, and blue, and take very short exposures so you can still capture the trapezium in the middle, and then uh, you stagger your exposures and only use the portion that you want. So there's one shot that's designated for the trapezium mm -hmm. and then uh, a medium shot and then a, a deeper one and then a, uh, one that may be a, a 10 minute shot for outer nebulosity and stack them all together. Right. And uh, you layer them in and uh, you'll end up with a great composite. And you'll see some of the stars. You were commenting, I think, on the color of the running man. There yeah. was some uh, really weird looking color. And if you look at some of the pictures taken with the really big telescopes, you'll see that color. Yeah. And uh, so it's, uh, it's actually real. Uh, I think some people would, if they get it, they, they kind of smudge over it so that uh, they can't believe that it's really there. Right. Fun yeah. stuff. But, uh, you're, you're still driven for it. You know, uh, one of the other things you've always done, too, Jack, I mean, you've written these books about uh, astrophotography and astronomy. Uh, you've done a lot of collaborations with uh, some great astronomers, like Terry Dickinson and uh, Philip Teese and some of these other guys. Um, the bed and breakfast that you have, what, what is that experience like? I mean, uh, uh, do advanced amateur astronomers come to you to take their astronomy, their astrophotography to the next level? Um, uh, you know, what, what you wanna, most, most people actually are, are, uh, are fairly naive um, as far as uh, um, astronomy goes and they want the experience. And, uh, and um, it, it's amazing too, the number of, uh, um, gifting that people will do for for people that really can't afford to do that sort of thing and they'll get a treat and uh, a gift certificate to come and uh, and uh, look through the telescopes and uh, I can with a with a half meter telescope and we're 1600 feet above the valley so we're also above the uh, light pollution so we get a we get uh, uh, the Milky Way horizon to horizon from our driveway 
even though we're only four kilometers from downtown uh, uh, Victoria, or three miles, and uh, but we're 1,600 feet up. Yeah, that's it makes a huge difference. And uh, so people will, will come in, and uh, I will give them a talk on astronomy. We'll talk about the formation of the universe, the uh, um, the fact that you took a, a singularity in a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second in at least 10 billion light years across. And, and uh, the uh, if you look at the horn that you've probably seen of the formation of the universe from the Big Bang on, well, three quarters of that horn, horn is the first three minutes. First of the, three minutes. Of, of yeah. Three minutes of the uh, expansion of the universe. And, uh, and then it took... Uh, about uh, um, 800 million years, which is not very long, to cool down enough um, so that uh, that atoms could form. And they only formed because the instant that the universe was formed, uh, a second trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, all of the fields were formed, electromagnetic fields, gravitational fields, the Higgs field, and uh, the atomic uh, uh, fields, two of them, one for uh, uh, that uh, gave us the nuclear energy in atoms, and the other is the decay of radiation. And uh, this all happened instantaneously. And uh, then, uh, as I said, uh, it took, uh, and the, of course, the Higgs field, which is very important, gave mass to the universe. And so when that all came together, a, what formed was hydrogen, number one on the periodic table, and not much of anything else. Mm. And as that hydrogen, because it had mass, starts to collapse and get pulled in, and clouds of hydrogen got bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, denser and denser and denser, and then the fusion engine turned on, and the stars lit up, and uh, the very first stars were born. Yeah, and they fused that hydrogen into helium and gave off heat and light, and uh, the, the universe had light. And everything else happened after that. All of your heavy elements were in, you know, created inside of stars, wow. from iron to uranium, the heaviest natural element. Jack, as someone that's discovered so many things, I mean, you, you've, you've got 200 supernova discoveries under your belt, more than that. Uh, what do you see as like the the milestones of discovery and astronomy in your in your lifetime? I mean, what what uh, what what blows you away? Well, I mean, obviously, yeah, um, the the formation of the universe blows me away, and the fact that uh, we only represent five percent of the universe, the stars, and uh, that's it, five percent. The rest is dark energy and dark matter, and we don't know. Balls about either of them. So. Discoveries. That, I mean, like for instance, gravity waves. You know, that's a that's a big. Well, yeah. that was a big. That's a big milestone because uh, I think that uh, that someday for us is going to be the propulsion that uh, that allows us to. Uh, we're going to create gravity, mm -hmm. and when we do that, the stars will open up to us. So that's it's really exciting. The uh, I think. Uh, um, to, to me, the, uh, the fact that uh, um, the Internet has been the biggest change to astronomy uh, as it is to medicine and everything else. And uh, um, that's done more for uh, we're doing this uh, over the Internet, and we couldn't have done this 20 years ago. Anybody in the world could watch uh, it. Yeah. Anybody can go on to... Uh, uh, the internet and, and buy themselves big aperture telescopes at, uh, at reasonable prices and are, are able to, to do things that are absolutely unheard of. And uh, I'll tell you, the, uh, it, I, I study the internet every day and I read the scientific papers that are coming up and it absolutely blows me away. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the sun is converting, they're, they're now talking with um, um, 4.5 billion tons of hydrogen is fused into helium every second. Every second. Every second. Um, you've got you've got internet that's telling me that you've got now two trillion galaxies. That's two thousand billion galaxies, and they're now saying that uh, uh, one out of 
four to two out of four stars in those galaxies, and you've got a trillion stars in a galaxy, yeah. um, um, has an Earth in the Goldilocks. Not, not Earth. And the Goldilocks has planets because they probably all have planets, right? They all have. You can't form when when stars form. Uh, there's a huge cloud of hydrogen starts to collapse, maybe from a shock wave from a supernova nearby, and they come like droplets of water. And as they get bigger and bigger, and they compress until the fusion engine turns on. But as they compress, they have to get rid of that compression energy. So they rotate to do that, and they start to spin. And then you spin a cloud of hydrogen, it puts a disk out all the way to Pluto, or past Pluto. And uh, that disk is in every every star as it's born. Right. And, uh, and what's really, really cool is that the gas giants are starting to wind up before the sun's even born in the disk. And they're winding up, all going counterclockwise, all spinning the same direction. And then uh, uh, once the sun reaches critical mass and the solar wind takes over, blows away all the 99%, the hydrogen and helium, leaves all the heavy elements in the inner solar system. They glom together and form planets and start cleaning up their orbits and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the rest is history. And all stars do exactly the same thing, and they can't do it any other way. Right. So every star, and you know, we've got half a million planets around our sun. There's no such thing as asteroids anymore. You've got regular planets out to uh, Neptune, and then you've got dwarf planets, which is Pluto and Sedna and Maki Maki and Kotar, and there's all these new ones. There's like 24 of them. That's, um, yeah, they're all planets. And you've got everything else as minor planets. Mm. So the simple rule is if it orbits the sun and doesn't orbit anything else, it's a planet. The planet. <laughs> so, uh, I've got a planet named after. I know this guy still argue with us about David this. Levy, <laughs> called Jack Alice for our work in astronomy. Uh, 30840. Yeah, someone so, asked about Alice here in our uh, the comments here. Uh, asteroid Jack Alice. Tell us about that. Charlie Walsh yeah. would like to know. Well, the, uh, um, I was very fortunate uh, because uh, um, and it was uh, basically David Levy who uh, um, had uh, discovered uh, um, many, um, um, uh, they call them asteroids, they're now minor planets. Minor planets. And uh, he, uh, he arranged uh, uh, with the shoemakers to... Uh, um, if they would release one and uh, call it Jack Alice for our work in astronomy outreach. Uh -huh. And that was presented to us by the IAU um, before I discovered my first supernova. And um, so um, that was a, an exciting moment. So I took pictures of it. And, uh, and, uh, and so you get recognized in, in different ways for your uh, for your work in astronomy, and because Alice was uh, uh, such a great supporter, and uh, and uh, she'd heard my talk so many times, she should she could give it, and uh, I could couldn't have done ten percent of what I've done uh, in my lifetime without Alice. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I you know, the, having uh, knowing Alice, uh, there's just not a lot of couples out there where they both do it together or uh, where you see the support, you know, as oh, a, oh, yeah. like you too. So uh, it's a, you know, it's great to. Uh, I'll give you some good advice. Every morning when she wakes up, the first word she hears is I love you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Mm -hmm. And to have a woman like that, that supports you in every way, and from editing uh, articles that I write to uh, just everything about astronomy, I tell her I want to spend ten thousand dollars on a mount. She says, "Write the check." Wow! And she controls all the money. <laughs> cool, huh? You gotta love a woman like that. That's for sure. And it's impossible not to love Alice, anyways, and you too, because you guys are such fabulous people, such interesting people, and you have done so oh. much. You've done. Come here. So much. Uh, I want to just show show everybody else, okay? She's coming. She's coming. I shouldn't say that. 
She's hurrying. Hurrying. Moving faster, me. <laughs> <laughs> this is moving fast for her. Everybody wants to know who Alice is. You all fans out there. Hi. There we go. Hi. Uh, this is Alice. Sure That's the best the world. And stars. Yeah. Stars. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Couldn't it's tell awesome. you the name of any of them, but they're there. Yeah. <laughs> she Hi, has, everybody. She has outfits that uh, support astronomy. You wouldn't believe. She's got, <laughs> she's got pants with galaxies on them. And, uh, awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. She's absolutely a superwoman. That's all <laughs> Super say. constellation woman. That's right. that's right. Well, Jack, thanks for spending an evening with me and with our, with our group here. And um, um, is there anything that you want to add to the end of this? I mean, no, but, uh, get out and keep looking up, everybody. Yeah. It's uh, it's an exciting world. That's right. Exciting universe. That's right. Jack, thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. All right, Scotty.